You've probably heard of Which Magazine, our home of hard-hitting journalism and informative stories delivered directly to our members. There's our travel, money and tech mags too. But did you know you can hear some of our best articles for free, available to listen to whenever you like? Each week on the Which Shorts podcast, we bring you a specially selected story, lovingly voiced and produced especially for you, on a whole range of fascinating topics. Just search Which Shorts wherever you're listening. Hi there, it's Lucia, host of the Witch Money podcast here. Before we start today's episode, I just wanted to tell you about a really handy new tool from us here at Witch, and even better, it's free. It's called My Money Health Check. All you need to do is answer a few quick questions about your finances, and then we'll do the rest, pointing you towards our brilliant witch advice that we think you'll find really useful. Once again, that's My Money Health Checks. If you want help with cutting your bills or making your money go further, it's the place for you. Just head to witch.co.uk forward slash My Money Health Check. When life gives you questions, which? Get Answers. Welcome. Thanks for tuning in to this Get Answers special from the team here at Witch. I'm Grace Farrell and throughout September we're sitting down in the studio with a host of brilliant experts in their own fields to help answer some of the biggest consumer questions of the moment and save us some money. Joining me today is property developer and broadcaster Marta D'Souza, who you may already be familiar with, as you'll often see her on the news, talking all things property and the housing market. And believe me, she knows her stuff. Welcome, Marta. Hi, Grace. Great introduction. Love it. <laughs> Absolutely love that. How are you doing? I'm good, thank you. Yeah, the property market, not so good, but um, mm. I'm well. <laughs> yes, we will get into that. Actually, before we dive into mortgages and kind of how to navigate the market and help your money go further, it would be good to hear a bit more about you, actually, because you've you've made a name for yourself in what's traditionally a very male-dominated industry. So can you tell us a bit about that and what drew you to property in the first place? Well, I grew up in the family property business, so I was thrown in the back of the car, surrounded by bags of cement and sand, and dragged onto building sites by my mother. My mother was Bob the Builder, Wendy, my dad, was in the office, and uh, so I had that role model. I never thought it was anything different. I thought women are meant to be on a construction site. So watching that and having, you know, plans on the kitchen table uh, and discussions about what what we were going to invest in next, what was going to happen, what we were going to build, was normal to me. So um, I set up on my own uh, in East London. I bought my first flat there. I made every mistake in the book. I had ceilings collapse. I bought uh, something that was too expensive. Um, and um, I refurbed my first flat. And I thought it was very normal to do that. I thought I should be working in that industry because I'd seen my mum do it all my life. But saying that, um, I realised that I couldn't even hire a, a female bricklayer. I couldn't hire a female roofer. And when I started looking into it, people were finding it very confusing as to why I was their boss. What what was I doing there? Um, And and that's when I realised that only 2% of women work in construction. 2% on site. Absolutely. It's such a small figure. Um, There's a stereotype that women don't belong in the industry. And Mm. um, I think... Um, I actually got asked once by the Sunday Telegraph, uh, there was a renowned surveyor that said that women don't belong on building sites because it will ruin their nails. And um, I said, you know, we prove them wrong going into boardrooms. We prove them wrong going uh, onto front lines. And Mm. now we'll prove them wrong again. And that's why I decided to set up Built by Her, a campaign to kind of change the face of construction and to make it more accessible to women. Uh, You know, growing up, Construction toys and army toys are for boys. Mm. Uh, Cleaning toys and nurturing toys are for girls. And so you live with that ingrained stereotype that you don't belong. Mm. There are signs everywhere saying men working overhead. Mm. um, And that kind of thing says you don't belong here. And they're saying it to me too. I don't belong there. And that because I have that stereotype, uh, that image of my mum going onto the site, 
I believe I could do it. And I want other people out there to see that you can do it. But it's not without its challenges. Uh, for me, I started off with one flat in Shoreditch. Uh, I invested there. Uh, when the artists moved there, I invested in the area because I thought this is where property prices are going to go up. I tried to put in period features. I tried to do all sorts of stuff like that. And, you know, one flat became two. I started converting warehouses into flats, um, eventually doing new builds. Um, and I think I started loving what I did and I just wanted more women to get that passion as well. Because at the end of the day, uh, creating spaces that affect people's every day is what I love about what I do. So you're going to spend uh, time in this space that I'm building for you with your family, with mm. your friends, with yourself. That's going to be part of your every day and it's going to affect your experiences. It's going to shape your life. And how cool is that to think that you have a small part in that? Mm. So, uh, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a great job and it's really fun and creative. And sometimes it's absolutely very difficult, very nerve wracking, uh, but full of adrenaline. And uh, that's why I love it. And I bet a key consideration for you is always the mortgage market, um, which is a subject that's obviously never far from the headlines at the moment. I mean, even just hearing the word mortgage rates now incites a fear in me, which it, it didn't used to before, but it's just the madness of where we are right now. So could you give us an idea of, of where we are? Do you think mortgage rates, are they going to settle? Are they going to keep going up or, or might they start to come down? If if I took you back to where I started, when I started, we were self-certifying how much we earned. So as self-employed people, you could say, oh, this is how much I earn. Mm. Uh, and you could certify yourself. But obviously, we had a big crisis. Um, you know, the bottom of the mortgage market fell out. People really couldn't afford the mortgages that they were being offered. Um, and um, everything changed, as we know. Uh, we had interest rates dropping by the Bank of England to such a small degree that, you know, the average mortgage uh, a few years ago was 1%. So mm. many people are still on the two-year fixed at 1%, at the five-year fixed at uh, 1%. But a lot of those mortgages are coming to an end and people are needing to remortgage. And now with the Bank of England raising interest rates to try and curb that really stubborn inflation that's gone up to, you know, over the, the 6% mark, it's only just only just in July started to kind of really taper and, and slow uh, the growth of prices really started to slow down. Um, interest rates have gone really, really high and people can't afford those monthly payments. People that were on mortgages before that were a thousand pounds are now going, you know, having to pay something like four thousand mm. pounds, five thousand uh, pounds. And with rising energy costs as well, it's just unaffordable and a lot of people are defaulting. We're seeing landlords put their full portfolios back on the market because the yields are just not good enough um, for, for people to continue uh renting out properties, they're just not making any money. And first time buyers, obviously always the ones that are most affected. Uh, there's no such thing as help to buy anymore. Um, some big new build developers are offering their own version of help to buy, but no government helped uh, back scheme. Um, there's still shared ownership. But again, um, those policies I always find are very election pleasing policies. They're for politicians to say, hey, we're helping the mm -hmm. first time buyers. But with average house prices, depending on which um, house price index server you look at, around the sort of 250,000, 220,000 mark for the, for the country, around the 500,000 mark for London, who can afford that on an average salary? Saying that, um, we are starting to see a slowdown in these rising interest rates by the Bank of England. And what's happening is we are seeing um, mortgage rates that are being offered becoming a little bit more favourable, especially with those secondary lenders, so the building societies. Right. They're offering things that are a little bit better. You're having really good rates that are around the 5.5 for a two-year fix yeah. uh, percent, which is, which is a little bit better. Look, we're never going to go back to the days of 1%. That's mm -hmm. just simply unsustainable. But I do think it's tapering off. Okay. In a few years, we might see them go back down to like the 4.5. Five. Interesting. Um, but uh, at the moment, you know, we hit 6% at a certain point during this year, uh, which is very scary for a lot of people. And um, yeah, I think we, we just need to be a little bit calm. Yeah. yeah. Don't try to fix at the 8.5. We're not going to go there. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I'm going to say. There's some offers there on the market, but just don't. Um, a lot of people are also opting for tracker rates because they think that the, the market is going to get a little bit better. Those interest rates are really going to taper off. Um, and I would agree. Okay, okay. I mean, do you think there's anything in, in holding off for a year? Say if you're saving for your first home and you were going to do it, you know, in the next few months, is it worth putting it off for a year? Do you think you'll get a better mortgage deal then? 
I think that at the moment, um, it, there's still quite a lot of instability. The rates by the Bank of England is still high. Um, but I do think it would be better if you hold off for a year. Mm. Um, Unless, and this is the caveat, you can really save in terms of your property purchase price. If you can get a discount on that price for a very large amount and you can afford those high monthly payments going forward, then of course, buy now. If you can get a good deal, it's always about yeah. getting a good deal. If you can get a good deal now, do it. There are not that many buyers on the market. You're not yeah. really going to have that much competition. But saying that, there are not that many properties on the market either because people are not going and listing their properties on the market because they're thinking, God, I'm not really going to get a good price for my property at the moment. And they're right. So it's, it's a bit of a tricky market. If is you is it a buyer's market then? I mean, if you, if you put in an offer or you see something you like... Is it likely that you'll be able to offer under and get it for a, for a really good price at the I moment? I would say so. It's very slow. Completions are taking around six months. So from offer accepted to completion, you're looking around six months. Usually the average is three uh, three months. Yeah. So yes, I would say that um, you can get a good deal. If you find the property you want, the problem is if they're not listed, um, you won't be able to find it. But if you keep an eye out and really, really speak to a good broker, try and get the best deal possible. Yes, you'll rate may be lower next year your mortgage rate may be lower next year but if you get a very good discount on your price and you make a low offer and it's accepted then your savings is much bigger you know if you're saving 100 pounds every month it doesn't compare to saving you know say 20 grand or 30,000 pounds or 40,000 yeah. pounds off your asking price yeah. you need to really see those differentials sometimes that small monthly saving does not equate to the huge shaving you can uh, make on your actual property mm. price that's a really good point and and with those tracker mortgages um I mean, are they the kind of mortgage deals, contracts even, that you can change if you want to? So if you went on to a tracker for a few months and then prices did start to decrease, could you kind of bail out of it and fix? Or are you kind of locked into a tracker mortgage for quite a long time? You can choose what you want to do. You can not lock yourself into a tracker mortgage and then the rate will probably be slightly um, higher, I would say, depending mm. on your lender. But speak to a good uh, mortgage broker. I think that um, you can just go onto a tracker, but it might be a little bit higher than what's out there. I would say maybe fix for two years. Right. See, see, see where it goes. Don't start fixing for five. Don't start fixing for 10. And do not... Do not, unless you are really, really sort of someone who just doesn't want to deal with remortgaging every couple of years and the stress of doing that, or you're afraid that your income's going to change and you don't want to be submitting bank slip, uh, uh, pay slips to mm. your bank. Um, uh, the only reason I would say to fix at the moment is if you have a, a reason to just not want to deal with anything financial. Yeah. If you're really wanting to save and you're really wanting to make a good investment, Try not to fix at the moment and uh, uh, really sort of wait. The market's going to settle. The, mm. the rates are going to go down. And we're already seeing that. We're really we're seeing banks lending at more affordable rates. So you don't think there's, um, there's a housing crash on the cards? That's a different question. Um, <laughs> I feel like uh, we are seeing prices go down by, by um, you know, prices gone down by 5% for the first time, depending on what server you're looking at. Um, is 5% going to make house prices affordable? That's the million dollar question. Is 10% going to, uh, 10% decrease going to make housing, uh, for house prices affordable? I, I just don't think so. You know, 500,000, you take 5%, 10% off. Um, it, it still doesn't make it an affordable price. No. Um, and I really think that, that there's one thing that we've seen with the property market in the UK and, and especially in England, it sustained a lot of things. It sustained uh, COVID. It's, it was, it, you know, it survived a, a major crash that then kind of started having prices grow seven times faster than wages. Um, we probably will see a slowdown. We might see a decrease, but nothing to the point where the market comes to a halt. I just don't think that's going to happen. But again, mm. I'm not mystic Meg. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, I, and, and I wouldn't uh, really kind of say that I know for 100% uh, certainty, but from where I'm sat, no, I don't think that will happen. Okay. Well, that's good to know. I mean, so latest figures from our own mortgage team at which suggest that four out of five people are now concerned about rising mortgage and rent costs. And that's actually the highest we've seen since we launched the tracker in 2013. 630,000 people missed a payment in the last month or so. So it, to me, it feels like we're in this new era of 
home affordability you know we just can't afford it anymore and you'll have older generations that will say well interest rates were so much higher when I bought a home and yet I was able to afford it but there's there's more to that isn't there I mean can you can you help us sort of can you help explain what has happened over the decades that means it's just so much harder to afford a home now than it used to be house prices so um you know 10 20 years ago um these older generations were paying a high interest rate but the they were paying a fraction for the cost of a property so 30 years ago you know 30,000 now average house price 200,000 250,000 um it's um it's just a, a question of numbers if you're talking about percentages yeah of course mortgage rates were at 10% 9% really really high figures but it's a percentage of a smaller number so I think the problem that we had was that not enough homes were being built. You need to Mm. build 200,000 homes a year to meet demand. It's a purely economic problem, supply and demand. There's not enough supply for the demand. And uh, as, you know, we we, we saw this, we saw, um, you know, rising house prices. um, We saw the fact that mortgage rates had to be uh, put up because the Bank of England was raising interest rates, um, it creates a really bad cocktail mm. <laughs> of unaffordability, which is really, really difficult for the first time buyers. And also, as you said, a lot of people defaulting on their mortgage. I think a lot of people will be caught in what we call the interest rate traps as well, um, which which means that they, they can't not they can't afford to sell because they have very little equity in their property um, and property prices are going down so they can't afford to sell and mm. um, they can't afford to remortgage because they've probably defaulted and they have bad credit scores and so they're stuck on a variable rate that is extraordinarily high really really strug- struggling and it's is where the government needs to step in mm. they had to step in before um, uh, when uh, we, we we had this mortgage crisis before uh, for some of the lenders like the big lenders of BlackRock it, during the subprime crisis they'll have to step in again they're saying they're not going to but i think as inflation is being curved they will step in again i i think that the unaffordability uh, of house prices is only going to be curbed by by um building more homes right um i i really think that that that's the way um i mean mean, that's going to have to be a huge amount of homes isn't it because i mean when i think about my children when i think about sort of how much harder it was for me to buy a house than it was for say my parents and then you think is it going to be, what, five times harder? I mean, is anyone going to, going to afford homes in 30 years? It's sort of children who are growing up now. I mean, you would have to build so many homes for, for it to become more affordable. I mean, do you think that's what will happen? So we've been having every government make promises that they're going to build 200,000 homes a year. Mm. Uh, Boris Johnson, when he was mayor of London, so we're looking back a few years already, um, I was on TV talking about how he was promising to build 200,000 homes a year. And no one has met that number. No one has. Uh, They've come up with different ways to try and give incentives for people to to build more homes. So things like um, building on green belts, uh, building on brownfield sites, uh, relaxing planning laws, allowing you to convert uh, commercial properties into residential properties much more quickly. Um, You know, we've even got a skills shortage. That's why I keep getting, you know, wanting women to come and work in construction because we're ignoring 50% of the potential Mm. workforce. You know, Brexit set made it that it's impossible to get bricklayers for big sites and things like that because now we need to pay them more to come from Europe. Um, it's um, it's quite difficult. There have been a lot of debates about how to fix that, how to give more incentives for there to be more homes. But you're completely right. Um, we just don't have enough homes. I don't see how we will build them. You know, um, councils started selling council homes and allowing for, you know, policies like right to buy Mm. for you to buy your own council homes, but not replacing them quick enough to be able to have council homes for those who can't afford to buy. So there's a sort of a full trap. And also, I think as well, a lot of people get stuck in the rental trap. Um, Their their rents are so, so high that they are simply pouring all their salary into um, the monthly rent. And I think uh, there's a statistic actually that said that 75% of um, all of your salary in London goes towards your rent. How can you save to afford Mm. very high deposits? How can you afford um, deposits for properties at half a million? You just can't. There's nothing to put away. Um, Are are there any alternatives for people who are renting and, as you say, just ploughing all of their money into rent and and realistically cannot afford to buy? Are there alternative paths to, to owning your own home? 
I think so. I mean, owning your own home is a very conservative policy. <laughs> That's a very conservative government policy that it's all about home ownership. You can think about it differently and think, why should I own? I should have experiences. Um, I should, uh, you know, go and live in different places. I should not have belongings. You know, the new generation, especially the Gen Zers, are all about, about experiences rather than actual ownership of things. But <laughs> that's a sort of a not very property uh, related answer. If we were talking about what you can actually do, uh, uh, really, um, it's things like, I would say, um, you know, go back to mum and dad, live at uh, mum and dad, save for a bit um, and um, be able to uh, kind of save up for those deposits that you need to pay, save for the mortgage payments that you're going to be, be able to pay. Um, I would say start saving on the big things. Um, so uh, try and save on uh you know, insurance, things like that. It's not not drinking that odd coffee per mm. month that's really going to save you enough money. In terms of schemes out there, so help to buy um, got removed. Right to buy is still out there, but help to buy got uh, removed, and rightly so, because all it was doing was raising prices on the lower end of the market. Uh, right. If it was making it easier for people to afford price, uh, house prices under 500000 um, then you know, developers and homeowners were simply r r kind of raising the price around the 500,000 because they had more people wanting to buy their property. So oh. that wasn't good. Um, but what you can do is there are a lot of good mortgages out there. So Skipton, for example, is offering an 100% mortgage um, that as long as the um, uh, monthly payment for you is just under the rent that you're paying and you've paid 12 months of rent in another property, um, they will offer you that mortgage. So that's a great, great offer. 5.49%, which is also a great interest rate. Hang on. So so just break that down for me. So, so, you're, so whatever you're paying in rent, you can get a mortgage at basically the same rate One because you've less. proven that you can pay that every month. It makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah. It's a very clever thing. It's saying, hey, you can afford to make those monthly payments. You have. You've shown reliability. So you're almost you're sort of you're you're worth your money, aren't you? Because you're paying those monthly payments. So I think um, banks getting creative like that is very important. Um, and uh, and this is a really good offer. And any good mortgage broker will have that on their books and be able to uh, show that to you and see if you can afford it. The problem is it might not be the property price that you want to pay. <laughs> mm. um, because to for your rent to equate to the higher mortgage rate of 5.49% for the property value that you want to pay for, um, and you want to live in, that might not um, be the case for you. But that's a step on the ladder. You can uh, use that to jump on the property ladder and then it's be a bit easier to navigate your way uh, in there if, you, if you're if you willing to just move that little bit further away um, you know, and use the good transport links that we have. Moving house with kids. Mom. Moving house checklist. Top packing tips. Do it ourselves or hire movers? Hiya! Things to do in the school holidays. Best solo holidays. When life gives you questions, get answers at which.co.uk. So let's go back to um, sort of trying to get your first home, applying for a mortgage, a mortgage sorry. Um, do you have any kind of do's and don'ts for mortgage applications to give you the best opportunity to get a mortgage that you're happy with, but also that you can afford? I would say speak to a very good mortgage broker. And if you don't get the answer you want, speak to another very good mortgage broker. And if you don't get the answer you want, speak to another very good mortgage broker and see what they have on the market. You must understand the mortgage broker is one human being. They have access to the whole of the market, but they may not be aware of certain nuances in different mortgages available. They'll have the best contacts with the underwriters of different banks, different building societies, and they'll find the best solution for you. But it's good to have an option. It's good to see different voices and hear different opinions. You do that if you sort of had, um, I don't know, you'd get a second opinion for most things. Why mm -hmm. don't you get a second opinion for your mortgage? Um, the other thing I would say is don't do a mortgage application by yourself. Get someone else to do it. They will paint you in the best light. They'll put your best foot forward. They'll present you in the best way. Um, the third thing I would say is don't use a mortgage broker recommended by your estate agent. In-house br uh, brokers have... Um, they have 
different uh, incentives because mm. they work for the estate agent. Mm. The estate agents work for sellers. They don't work for buyers. So I always say that actually you shouldn't be using those estate agents. They they have um, uh, under their remit, they have to show you the full market, but sometimes they don't have access to the full market. And again, they work for the estate agent. They're not working for you specifically. Mm. Um, I think that's quite key. But again, um, What's very important um, is also, I would say, if you're making an offer on a property, um, you should always say, um, I am the best buyer to buy this property. So if you're making an offer on any property and you're trying to negotiate, um, uh, the, the first thing you should be doing is saying, this is my mortgage broker. This is my um, solicitor's contact. I'm ready to go. Mm. I've got a mortgage in principle in place. Um, I've got my ducks in a row and I am the buyer and I'm very keen to buy this property. But and how I love do you it. do that? I mean, do you do that via your estate agent, but via the estate agent of the house even? 100%. So okay. the estate agent uh, has a legal duty to put forward any offer that you um, put forward to the buyer, the, to their buyer, uh, sorry, to their seller. Yeah. And um, the way you can do that is just write them a simple email and have that lined up already. So your first step, speaking to a good mortgage broker, finding the right broker, they will tell you how much you can afford. And you'll say to them, hey, I, um, I want to afford around this amount. And they'll tell you if you can or cannot. Then having a good conveyance or solicitor that you already have spoken to and said, hey, I'm looking to buy a property. Um, can you be my conveyancer? 100%. They'll, they'll, you have those figures ready. Get that email ready. So when you go and see something that you like, or oh, when you get home, type up that email, send it straight through to a estate agent. Mm. This is my offer. I think it's a very strong offer because of this. This is uh, X amount of cash uh, for my deposit. This is my mortgage in principle. This is what my solicitor's contact. And if you imagine as a seller, if you saw that, you think, well, this person they is mean legit. business. They mean business. They know what they're doing. They've got everything lined up. This isn't a first time buyer or someone who's never bought or someone who's simply kind of just trying to, you know, just have a go and just mm. put an offer in. You'll probably be um, uh, have an offer accepted that's lower than other offers simply because you are the better, stronger, more reliable buyer. Interesting. Uh, I always advise people to do that because I think you're missing out if you're not because mm. other people do. And I think do it quickly. If you like something, just jump on it. Mm. Um, one of the things I do when I look for properties um, is I'll have, I'll go onto the, all the major sites, right, move, Zoopla, on the market, all of them. I'll, I'll draw out the areas that I'm looking properties in that you can draw out maps and get alerts. Be aware that whenever you look for properties, a lot of the stuff that's still listed is probably not available. Okay. So once what you do is you contact those people, you contact um, those estate agents that are listing those properties, they'll sign you up. And once they sign you up, everything that comes on that's new, that's not even hit these listing websites like Right Move or Zoopla or on the market, uh, will come into your inbox. They'll call you up even before they have photographs. So you get there first before everyone else. Mm. And then what I do do is, uh, before I make my offer is I look at other properties in the area. I call up a estate agent and say, well, you know, what have you sold recently? What have you sold it for? I look at um, sold prices in the area. I look at what's listed and I find out the price per square foot for the level of finish of that property. Right. And then I make my offer at 20% lower than the asking price. Okay. <laughs> wow. I love it. It's just, and so, you know, you need to start from a point of negotiation. Yeah. Um, and so, you don't, so you don't think final. that that's going to like harm you and, and make you look like you're kind of taking the mick a bit by, by going go in up. too low. You just can't go down, can you? Yeah. You can go up. Yes, it, it does. But if you go in quick and you're a strong buyer and you uh, show yourself as being a strong buyer, you can always just quickly, you know, if it's, if this agent says to you, absolutely not, I'm not even putting that forward. Yeah. Okay. Then go more realistic or there you have to obviously sense how long, you know, the questions I always ask when I go for a viewing are how long's the property been on the market? What's the incentive of the seller to sell? Are they getting divorced? Are they wanting to move quickly? Are they in a chain? Which means that obviously they have another property they're trying to purchase. Mm -hmm. When is the chain completing? Do they need to buy quickly? Uh, are they willing to wait a longer time? And then I make myself the, be the best buyer <laughs> for that seller. So I'll say, oh, I'll wait as long as you need. <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, ready to move now. I'm ready to move right now if you need to. Um, you know, most uh, transactions fall through. So if you speak to an estate agent that's looking at their pipeline and seeing, um, you know, uh, how much money they're going to make at the end of the month, they'll say to you they have to factor in a 50% fall through rate of right. all 
transactions going through. And at the moment, we're looking at six months from offer acceptance to completion. So there's a lot that can happen. There's a lot of gazundering, a lot of gazumping, a lot of transactions falling through because of these chains, because people can't sell, because their mortgage offers fall through, because they suddenly can't move. Um, so um, it's very important to kind of uh, try your best to be the best buyer you can and really move around that, mm. that buying and selling game very well. And I call it a game because I find it, it's a very archaic system. It's uh, it's very antiquated. You go to the US, you make an offer, you need to put a deposit down and yeah. you've got a contract. I can go in and now put an offer on a five million pound property with, you know, having 5P to my name. Yeah. And it's only it takes a good estate agent to ask me for proof of funds and to look at those proof of funds and to actually say, yes, oh yes, this person has the money they should do. I mean, all good estate agents would do that. But all I'm saying is um, it's a difficult process. It's emotional. Yeah. It's a roller coaster, and, and um, they, they say it's this. Is it the second most stressful thing after getting married? I, I something mean, like it, that. It, it surely is. It's your biggest purchase, your biggest transaction, mm. uh, and it involves moving. Mm. It, it involves the uncertainty of moving. Yeah. Um, and I do think that, you know. Um, one of the things that we really don't do in this country is we don't like to talk to other other people. You know, we speak through an estate agent or mm. through our solicitors. And it can get a bit, I think a lot of listeners might also empathise with this, get a little bit testy at times. You get, mm, yeah. you get, it can be a little bit nasty. You can think that people have the wrong intentions. And sometimes you can just say to the estate agent, can I speak to the buyer? And it's very uncommon to do it uh, in England, but um, it is done. And if you really get to a point where you think, God, this transaction's going to fall through, speak to your buyer, speak to your seller, ask for a meeting at the property. If there's something you're unhappy about, you know, you sort of, oh, I don't think this has been referred very well. Speak to them. We're all humans. And I think face to face is better than, you know, through Chinese whispers of emails. Um, mm. And uh, yeah, I think I've had a few transactions that I've been involved in where it's been resolved by just having a meeting uh, with my with my buyers. Right. Yeah, interesting. And and so with mortgages, do you think it's always better to to stretch yourself as far as you could go or leave yourself a bit of a buffer? It's a good question. I mean, I don't think I should support stretching yourself as far as you go because that's what happened in the subprime uh, crisis. It right. was you were basically buying things that you you just couldn't afford. But saying that, um, you know, when borrowing money was cheap, when we were looking at one percent, of course, it, uh, fantastic. You know, one percent of a hundred thousand, you know, <laughs> it's not much. It's just sort of like you know, it's, it's mm. such a tiny amount per month. Yeah. Um. So I would say, of course, get the biggest mortgage you can, and then um, it, it's it's cheap money. It's you don't you're not really you know one percent is is nothing. Um. Mm. So it, essentially, you um you you should be pushing yourself because if you put that money in a bank and a savings account, you'd be making very little on it. So mm. um. If you took that money and invested it somewhere else, or uh, not in a savings account, but in a, you know in another project or something else that you're doing, um, uh, I think that that would be worth it. But now uh, we've got really high rates. If you leave very little equity in your property and you're forced to sell suddenly because of personal s situations, um, you know it's the three Ds: um, the death, divorce, and uh, uh, debt. Uh, mm. And um, if you're suddenly in one of those situations where you have to sell immediately um, and you've just got no equity, prices are going down slightly, you don't have that buffer. Yeah. You really don't have that that thing where you can say, hey, I'm just going to take a bit off the asking price uh, and, yeah. and and be left in a situation that, that that's OK. Um, and I think if you if you do that, then it's good. And also, I think um, a lot of people want stability now. They want to repay their mortgages off. They mm. don't want to be sat on equity and not being able to remortgage in 20, 30 years, because you won't be able to get a mortgage. You, you can't get a mortgage. The older you get, the harder yeah. it is to get a mortgage, the higher the rates are. Um, and uh, that that's going to be tricky. Mm -hmm. And so when, when you're looking at properties, what would you say are the biggest red flags to look out for that people might not think about? Structure. So I think that's the first one. If you walk in and you see a big crack that is bigger than, um, so I'm, a, I'm the daughter of a structural engineer. Mm. So I, <laughs> my dad says, as a rule of thumb, if, uh, if, a, it's, if it's a crack bigger than a thumb, um, <laughs> it's an easy one to remember, uh, then get worried. Um, the other thing is, if you're buying a leasehold property, years, years uh, on the lease, 
of if if it's very if it's under a hundred, be dubious. I mean, uh, above ninety is fine, but just be dubious. Mm. Um, service charges as well, um, and how they're going to grow. Rent increases on the uh, on the service charges of a leasehold property. Very important to check those. Um, one of the other things I would say is um, once you get those search reports back from your solicitor, compare what the plans are in those in that pack so you'll get a pack and sometimes they'll have a plan of what your the area of your property is what rooms it has how big it is and compare that to what you can see in real life and Mm. (laughs) the reason i say this is because uh some people uh list on estate agent websites that their property has a terrace that's not legal they (laughs) they um show that their property is three rooms but actually and um, one of them isn't legal. So right. just make sure you do those checks. Very important. Um, uh, well, the other thing I do is I go through and on my maybe second or third visit, I check every light switch. I check if all the appliances are working. Nobody ever turns them on. It's very important to do that. Right. Um, I am. Um, I look. Um, I kind of smell to see if I can smell fresh, <laughs> fresh paint. And it's, okay. a, it's a weird thing to say because usually people co- cover up damp um patches oh so you so paint. You, fresh paint wouldn't be a good smell then no it's a terrible smell ah. <laughs> avoid it at all costs <laughs> avoid it at all costs so um if you can smell fresh paint you know that someone's been covering up something and done it very quickly um and it, sometimes what happens is they paint it and then they leave it to dry and the, the the stain will come up the next day but when you view it it's not there but when it dries fully it does come up so that's important um i would say um go and speak to the neighbors so go on a day that you're not viewing the property, n- knock on doors and say, you know, what, what's it like to live here? You want to know who you're going to be surrounded by. Mm. Um, go at different times of the day. Go, um, you know, in different types of weather. Uh, I think that those are, those are key things that that, that I would check um, in in a property. And I guess red flags I, uh, would be, uh, you know, look at what is the intensive of the seller to sell. So for example, they've been there for 30 years. Well, I think that's not a red flag at all. That's quite a nice thing, right? They've been there for a really long time. If they're selling in six months, what's the reason they're selling? Are they really unhappy there? Um, I think that that's really important. But also see, for example, um, I've had a lot of problems where people have said they've bought a beautiful garden flat and then they've had they can hear the the, the neighbors upstairs stomping around mm. so try and go for viewings at times uh, where there would be your neighbors would be there so you can hear what it sounds like and what i do is i tend to go in and just take some time in every room where the state agent isn't there and you're just taking that moment mm. of peace in every room just to see how it feels mm. how the space feels with just you in it with no no one else and take photos because sometimes you go through and you miss a lot of things but with a photo and a video you can go back and look at everything yeah um, and that's uh, very very important yeah oh this is such good advice so I'm, I'm loving picking your brain here um honestly it's been so good to have you on the podcast and it's so good to see a woman paving the way uh, in the world of property development and i'd love to just end on just what you think needs to to change really to, to get more people working in the industry i think we need to change who our pioneers are uh, in terms of uh, our visionaries, our, our people that we can look up to. Uh, we need to show um, and champion the women that are already doing a great job in the industry, the women that are there uh, every day. You know, Crossrail does a great job of this. We see amazing female engineers doing great work, amazing, amazing site inspectors at the big developers. We need to see images of them plastered absolutely everywhere. And if there's a building company out there that will take down their men at work signs. Yeah. Um, I would really appreciate that because I've been on building sites recently and they've had posters for safety um, and they've all been men. They've all been white men. Change it, become all diverse because actually who you're building for, um, your clients that you're building for are diverse. They want to see that too. Um, you know, uh, people are much, they hold much more accountability to who they're buying from that, these days. And uh, um, yeah, it's really important. And also don't forget, as women, we br- b- bring such a different quality to um, the workplace. And for the construction workplace, we also bring that different uh, quality too. Uh, and I and I do think that if we just get enough people to take that first step into the industry, they'll understand the exciting opportunities that are out there. Mm-hmm. Amazing. Well, where could we um, hear more of your work? 
Well, you can uh, find everything on uh, my Instagram, Marta underscore D'Souza. Uh, I've also got a podcast coming soon, which is At Home With. And you can catch me every other week on BBC London Radio at 11pm on uh, Joe Good to Chew in the Fat. So, um, yeah, you might see my face as well on uh, other TV shows talking about property. But, uh, yeah, follow me on Insta and you'll know exactly uh, what I'm doing and when. <laughs> Awesome. Well, I hope you enjoyed this Get Answers special. Make sure you catch our next episode on supermarket spending that will be coming out before the end of this month. For more expert advice on mortgages, property and personal finance, do check out our weekly Witch Money podcast. You can listen to hand-picked Witch magazine articles for free by searching Witch Shorts. And we've got more answers to all manner of questions like the ones you've heard in this episode over on the Witch website. Today's Get Answers special was presented by me, Grace Farrell, produced and recorded by Rob Lilly and edited by Eric Breer. And thanks again to our wonderful guest, Marta D'Souza. When life gives you questions, which Get Answers. Scammers are stealing hundreds of millions of pounds every year. They bombard us with fraudulent texts, emails and calls. And what's more, their tactics are getting increasingly sinister. To keep across the latest scams, sign up to our free Scam Alert service to help you stay ahead of the latest scams and protect yourself. Go to witch.co.uk forward slash scam alert dash newsletter. That's witch.co.uk forward slash scam alert dash newsletter. Thank you. Thank you.